I am here again with Gary Sikich, and we're continuing with our final fourth part segment in this discussion about global cyber insecurity as it relates to the energy sector. And in this segment, we'll be telling you a little bit more about some of the things that need to happen um, related to the incident response of a data breach for the energy sector. Gary, thanks for coming back. Thanks, Lee, for having me. I think this is probably one of those areas that is challenging to talk about. Yeah, certainly. And at the forefront, when things first go wrong, there's a need to immediately take action to help preserve the data and collect data so that it can be analyzed. But at the same time, there's a competing demand of wanting the organization to function. And sometimes those those two uh, needs uh, create conflicts. So they, they sort of butt heads, if you will. Uh, yeah, the, I think the, the, the issue for a number of organizations, and I've experienced being in the kind of command center, if you will, uh, of, a, of organizations where their, their, you know, their website had, been, had gone down. And it was one of these where a lot of stuff was processed through the portals that they had there. Suddenly there was this pressure to get things back up and then to look at what is this costing us because now our customers cannot execute their you know, orders and whatnot. Um, and that becomes a challenge because it's the urgency issue. Uh, the other aspect is, is that when we look at incident response, and this is a little bit different from the typical natural disaster incident response. Sure. If I've been breached in a cyber incident, how long is it before I actually realize that I've been breached? Uh, it may not happen very quickly. It could be very subtle and things could be manipulated and suddenly I'm in a situation like some of the big companies mm -hmm. that had data hacked where all of a sudden personal accounts of cardholders are exposed. Now what do I do? So mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of uh, not only rapid response that's needed, but a lot of consequence analysis that's really needed. Exactly. How do you do that and yet maintain, as you were saying, the, the cyber record so that I actually can go back and begin to look at that from yeah. not only a legal standpoint, but from uh, a defensive standpoint? Yeah. Well, there's a lot that needs to happen in a short period of time. You have, you have the collection and preservation, which forensic professionals are often called in, such as myself. Uh, to collect the data off firewalls, servers, logs. Then you also have the analysis of that data to determine what, it, what are the motivations of the attacker. Mm -hmm. uh, was it an attacker? Was it negligence? You know, oftentimes things go down, people assume it's a cyber attack, um, external. It could be an internal attack. It could just be something, something as innocent as I, I've seen a new system coming online that's supposed to help back up and provide redundancy actually reformat a storage NAS array <laughs> that it was supposed to help protect. So, so these Oops. things can happen in, in quickly understanding, making sure that data doesn't disappear that could be used to rebuild is important. Yeah. And that's where bringing in an outsider is important because someone new coming in doesn't have skin in the game and you really need that objective party to help you figure out what's happening. But I think that in that respect, when you begin bringing someone from outside, they also have a vested interest in making sure that from not only a reputation standpoint, but also from the standpoint of uh, viability of their services, making sure that they're helping to yeah. alleviate the issue and to bring back some uh, equilibrium, if you will. So, so there's this uh, yeah. this issue of consequence management yeah. that comes to bear on them. And you have you have some conflicts that happen with having the people that were kind of in charge of watching over the equipment do the investigation, and that can cause some serious problems to the organization. And it may be very well that no. the attack wasn't the fault of the people responsible for managing it, but mm -hmm. if if, for instance, there was um, an action that took place that might show some carelessness or uh, mishandling of events by the people in charge of IT, there, there's a real risk there that that person might 
take actions that could result in further data destruction mm -hmm. to, in an effort mm -hmm. to cover up what had happened. So now, it, in that respect, I've heard we need to protect. We need to, do, to begin to look at how we manage the data collection post-incident or during an incident, if you will. Mm -hmm. There are obviously some legal ramifications. Yeah, well, um, well, whoever does this might have to testify, and that, that's another reason why having a third party come in to do this work is important because you may want, legal may want to know, well, before we put an expert up to testify in this, just tell us what happened and how do we respond, how do we get ahead of this? If it was a problem with a vendor, you want to know that because the, the clock's ticking, mm -hmm. you know, from mm -hmm. the time a data breach is confirmed as a real data breach and known uh, to the time it has to be reported, oftentimes it's 30 days. So there's not a lot of time yeah, to, 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 to wait around wait. if your data breach before you get in your, your expert, your forensic expert okay, to inspect. So, so we've got a legal consideration that has to be looked at. Insurance today has changed in a lot of respects. So business interruption insurance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a, a critical area because if you want to file a claim... You have to report it to the carrier, or even if you have cyber coverage, uh, it might not be covered if you failed to notify the insurance company of the incident. So when I look at that aspect and say, I've got a business interruption policy. Mm -hmm. You mentioned cyber. Uh, I, I know that there are other writers to those policies, like for terrorism and things mm -hmm. like that today. If I don't have a cyber writer, which is a contingent business interruption issue, my business interruption insurance may not cover me on something like that. So it really no. becomes more incumbent to have, one, the knowledge, two, to be able to look at the legal considerations, three, to begin to understand insurance-wise, what do I have from a coverage standpoint, mm -hmm. which is where the traditional yeah. risk management group comes into exactly. play. And, and but it, IT's got to coordinate with them exactly. to ensure all that. Exactly. And it, I had uh, Todd Rowe on my show, who's an insurance cyber attorney that mm -hmm. deals with these coverage issues. So that's excellent video to watch that delves into that more. Mm -hmm. um, the other things, though, with incident response, you have, you know, you have the potential PR issues that relate to oh. being data breached. So really, you need to assemble your team, your 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 in-house legal your HR, your, your media advisor, uh, preferably you have a PR firm that has dealt with data breaches before. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to put together a plan and all this stuff needs to be going on in parallel. Uh, so while that's happening, your internal people are probably trying to work on getting their disaster recovery systems restored. You might even have an outside IT provider coming in to help bring that, the systems back up online. Um, the, the workload that happens when a data breach has occurred is such that it really isn't pragmatic or practical to try to have internal IT do all the work. Mm -hmm. And it also isn't covered by insurance typically. The outside providers will usually be covered, but not the internal people. So if from a structural standpoint, and I'll draw this to, to the areas that I worked in many years back after some of the events in the energy industry, oil spills and things like that, where industries adopted what they called an incident command system. The United States now has the National Incident Management System. Mm -hmm. So with cyber, though, the composition in terms of that team is not necessarily the same that we would see in a typical incident command system as is generally presented. So from a functional standpoint, I think that there are some things that I would look at. One, somebody's got to be in charge. Two, somebody's got to look at planning, what's going on in future planning, what do we do? Three, operationally, what's affected, what's not affected, how do we keep it from cascading? Mm -hmm. uh, for a communications perspective, internal and external, uh, a, an administrative function which looks at the financial aspects, mm -hmm. uh, an infrastructure function which, again, internal, external infrastructure, and then uh, the, the aspect of you know, bringing this all together as a team, your HR people, yeah. all these other things. So yeah. Well, yeah. That was an excellent wrap up, Gary. Uh, I really appreciate you being on the show. If you like this uh, video, please share it and check out the other segments we did as well. Thanks again, Gary, for Thank you.